A-R-E podcast episode number 71. Welcome to the Welcome to the A-R-E podcast. A-R-E podcast. Where it's all about encouraging and inspiring you today so you can fulfill your dream of becoming a licensed architect tomorrow. And now your host, David Doucette. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the ARE Podcast, joined as always by our co-host, Eric Corey Freed. Eric, how are you? I'm good. Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about the only, and I use the word only, three ways to change a contract, because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion on ways the actual contract gets changed, and that's the contract between the owner and and the general contractor. So there's only three ways that actually gets changed. And there's really only two, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and we'll we'll talk about each one and clear up a lot of confusion that we hear um, from candidates, both in chat and in our own coaching program about how exactly these three tools work, when to use them, which is what we're going to discuss right now. So Eric, why don't you start us off with the architect supplemental instructions, which is kind of the first way. So the architect supplemental instructions or ASI, as they're called for short, it's uh, known as AIA G710, right? For short. (laughs) Uh, And essentially, you're doing ASIs all the time. You might not realize it because your project manager is probably handling it, but Really, this is when there is no change to the contract sum or the contract time. That's why they're supplemental instructions, because you're essentially changing the nature of the contract, but it's not impacting the budget or the or the or the time schedule. So it's a very um, so what what know, what contract is way to change the contract? What contract exactly? Because we hear that right, and I think sometimes we don't really understand. Well, what contract are we talking about? So what contract are we talking about? We're talking about the contract for construction. Now, candidates will often confuse or conflate the the contract for construction, which is really between the owner and the contractor, and 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 the the word contract will then be conflated with the architect's own contract with the owner. We're not talking about the contract between the owner and the architect. That's for your services. That includes your <clears throat> scope of work, how you're getting paid, how much you're getting paid, how you handle additional services, like all that stuff. We are talking about the construction contract. Uh, essentially the one they're going to use to build to build the project. The, and what candidates often fail to kind of recognize is this is a legally binding contract. That's why we call them contract documents because they are technically part of the contract, right? As we're, as we're creating them. So uh, these are changes to the contract. And if you're changing the contract sum or the contract time, you can't use architect supplemental instructions to do that. But if you're just making a change that's minor, like the wall is going to be purple instead of red, and it's not going to cost any more, and it's not going to change the schedule, well, technically that would fall under no change to the construction cost, no tra- change to the construction time. Architect supplemental instructions or an ASI is all you need. Which candidates love to to throw around ASI and RFI. You know, oh, something's during construction. Do I need do I need an ASI or do I issue an RFI? And and that's kind of part of what we want to explain to you guys uh, today. The contract we're talking about is the A101, right? That's the contract between the owner and the general contractor. When we start as architects monkeying with that contract, as Eric said, it's a legal document. Um, we need vehicles or tools to legally do that. So issuing a revision or an SK is not a legal tool to do that per se. It needs to be attached to one of the three documents we're talking about today, either the ASI, the Architect Supplemental Instructions, or the next one, which is the change order. And Eric, tell us about that one. So the change order is the one that I think most candidates, they ask us about, and they think that the change order is the catch-all for any change to the contract at all. Uh, That's not true. The change order is when there is a change to either the contract sum or the contract time. Hey, uh, we're suddenly going to add a water slide to the project, right? It wasn't there before. And the the owner had signed off on the drawings prior, and now suddenly he or she wants to add a water slide. Uh, Well, that's a change order. I mean, your first thought should be, oh, you know, change order alarm should go off in your head. And obviously that's going to add 
likely it's going to add both cost to the construction and time to the schedule. And so that's what a change order is for. When you're, whenever you're changing the construction cost or the construction time or both. And more importantly, it's when everybody's pretty much in agreement of those changes. Right. right. So we issue a CO or a change order and it explains the, the change in the contract. We are now adding a water slide. Contractor estimates it to be $52 million or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and it's going to add three months to the construction contract. And then it is signed by all three parties showing the agreement. That is a change order. Uh, the, uh, the trouble is, is that most candidates assume that a change order is anything, whether we agree or not, whether it's minor or major or not. They just use the word change order as a synonym for all of these things, including an ASI. And that's just not the case. So if the, the contractor and the owner agree using the A101, their contract is 20 million, right? And now we're in construction and they want to add a water slide. Let's say the water slide is 52 million to use the number you used. That would be right. a change order. And it's not a change order for us doing our services. This would be an additional service for us. This is, has nothing to do with a change order. Us just doing additional services to provide this water slide just an additional service. We we don't really do change orders for our own scope of work. Change order or is for construction and is between the owner and the general contractor. One thing I forgot to mention about the uh, the architect supplemental instructions, the ASI, it's just one document. It's the G710. And the very first line says the contractor shall carry out the work in accordance with the following supplemental instructions without change in contract summertime. So look at this form. You can you can um, download it from AIA's website. I think if you register now, you can get it. You can look at it for free. But these forms are self-explanatory. So I think a lot of the questions we sometimes get is because a candidate hasn't looked at the form. So uh, and also by looking at the, the G710, you see only the architect's signature is on there. That's all that's required. The owner doesn't need to sign off. Obviously, we have their approval probably from you know an email or whatever it is. But in terms of the legal document that makes whatever this change is for the ASI, it's just the architect that signs it. So, yeah, and if you know, it's it's funny because so many candidates will come to us with questions. Um, my head is I'm so fuzzy. I'm so confused about the difference between architect supplemental instructions and a change order. And if they, if they just took a minute to read the ASI form G710, which you can download as a PDF for free, just Google it and you'll find it. AI has still right now has samples of it for free. It's one page and it, and you'll notice at the bottom of the page, as David said, it's, it's only signed by the architect. Why? Because there's no change to the construction time. There's no change to the construction cost. We don't need the contractor or the owner to agree. We're just making a minor change. And typically with an ASI, we'll, we'll attach uh, exhibits, we call them officially, but we'll attach little SK drawings of here's the change we're talking about. And it's all just documenting a case of these are in addition to the contract documents, this is a legal change to that construction contract. Right. And it really, even though it's minor and it doesn't change the cost or time, it really does change that contract, the A101 and the scope of work between the, the owner and the general contractor. It just doesn't affect cost or time. So it's not changing that $20 million number, um, but it is still changing it in a minor way. So that's why it is one of the three vehicles. And the reason why we're talking about these three vehicles, once the owner and contractor sign that A101. These three vehicles are the only thing that can change it. That's it. There's no, you need whatever you do, revisions, SKs, exhibits, it's all going to be attached to one of these three legal documents to uh, amend the contract, the, the A101 between the owner and the general contractor. Okay. So, and then the, the change order is if there's a change in cost or time, Often it's both. Uh, and again, if you look at the the G701 is what it is, it's one page and all three parties have to sign this to agree. And this is the one that is most commonly used. Yeah. And what I love about, again, it's, it's a simple one page form. And if you just read it, you'll totally get it. What I love about it is there's a couple details in the G701, the change order form that I love. 
Number one, as you mentioned, at the bottom, clears the, clears the bell, architect, contractor, owner, right at the bottom for all three to sign. And they're essentially signaling their agreement of this change to the contract. Number two, one of the lines in it is the original contract sum was blank. And you literally just write in whatever the original GMP or whatever it was, was. And if there's a change to that amount, then you put the, the net change, you know, in this case, a water slide, $52 million, right, or whatever. But then the line below it, it then says uh, the new contract time is going to be increased or decreased or unchanged by blank days. It's all spelled out right there in the form, very clear as a bell. And you're, you should think of these forms, the ASI, the change order, and the next one we're going to talk about, the construction change directive. You should think about all three of these as really amendments to the original construction contract. That's, that's, that's how to see them. And what's interesting here about the G701 and why this is the G701 and the ASI is the G710, I have no idea. Um, I like to think of these in as order as the ASI first and then the change order and then the construction change directive. That's kind of a good workflow of, of how to think about them. But just changing the contract time is a change order, right? Put, putting in new toilets, uh, it's not going to cost any more, but it's going to delay us by seven days or it's going to add seven days to the project. That's a real contractual change to, again, that A101. Um, time is money, right, as we hear. So even just changing time can have a domino effect for the owner uh, in all kinds of ways, whether interest payments or mortgages or whatever it might be or you know any kind of stuff like that. So just um, time is kind of as important as the contractual number. Right, and that that's that's what this tool uh, is is used for. And this is where your own project experiences can really backfire on you, if if your if the sum of your architectural experience in in your career has been working on, oh, I don't know, let's say um, residential, not to beat up on residential, but let's say let's say you've only done residential projects, and you're thinking seven days, what's the big deal? Right? Who cares? You have to realize that from an AIA perspective, and 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 this is the perspective NCARB's looking at, from an AIA perspective, seven days is a make or break of a contract, especially if the contract has a specific date of substantial completion written in. You know, substantial completion will be completed by February 1st, you know, whatever. Seven days is a make or break between that contractor being in compliance with the contract or being in violation of that contract and thereby jeopardizing whether they get paid or not. So just because you and your residential experience feel like, what's the big deal? We're off, you know, we don't even have a date of substantial completion projected. You know, it just, it's done when it's done. And we've been, you know, willy nilly about it the whole time. That is not the right mindset you need for this exam, especially when being asked questions about changes to the construction contract. Yeah, residential is is much more loosey goosey as I think uh, most of us uh, know, and yeah, in residential you're not likely to use these forms. Um, in all my years of doing residential, I tried using AI documents and it just it, it confused the owner and it just it really muddied the process. So when change orders would come in, it was usually just the contractor would submit something you know on a piece of paper. But you know this is an AIA based exam. Meaning it's it's probably also very commercially based, right? This is not a residential uh, based exam. So it's important to keep that in mind. And if you guys haven't seen these forms in your office, go to your project manager or your boss and just ask for the file on an old project. Like, hey, I want to see what the change orders, you know, were. And they they should be willing kind of to to share that information with you. It should be sort of fairly easy to to dig up or even a current project you're on. You know, just just ask. You know, what's funny, what's funny about all this is a lot of this is not occurring uh, in a big production in public view. Right. Most, most of the ASIs and COs that that are getting filled out, I, I can tell you from experience and also like within my own firm, the project managers catching up on paperwork on, you know, on a Thursday night at home, <laughs> just getting this done. So it's not like they're walking around the office saying, hey, I'm, I'm filling out the, the change <laughs> right. orders now. Anybody want to come and look? It's just so a lot of it's just done 
done quietly, you know, with their head down at their desk. And so you as a, as a, you know, a, a young architect trying to gain experience, you're probably not knowingly exposed to this stuff. So you speaking up and saying, Hey, could I just see what they look like? Um, first of all, would show great initiative on your part, but secondly, um, they're like, yeah, it's boring as hell. Here you go. Like to them, it's just more paperwork, but I'm sure they'd be happy to show you. Well, the, absolutely. They would be happy to show you. And as, as I tell candidates all the time on our Monday round table, it doesn't take much to stand out from the crowd. It really doesn't. So if you go to your boss tomorrow and you're like, Hey, can you, so, can you show me some change orders? They'll probably look a little shocked because probably nobody has asked them that before. Uh, and number two, yeah, they would be more than happy. Um, or, you know, like, Hey, I'll stay after work on my own dime. You don't have to pay me just, you know, how do you do this? I just want to see how you do it. And, and they should be more than willing to kind of walk you through that process. Cause like Eric said, it shows initiative and as project managers, that's kind of what we're looking for. You know, we've got a whole bunch of people under us. We're looking for the people who stand out and I don't have the time you know, as the project manager to figure out necessarily who's standing out. It's kind of like, I need them to come to me and ask me good questions and, and be inquisitive and be interested. That stands out to me. And like, maybe on the next project, I, you know, I bring them on or I elevate them or, or whatever it might be. So this isn't just about, you know, the G701. This, this is an opportunity for, um, you know, professional enhancement in and potentially career enhancement just from being curious. All right, so let's get into the last one. This is probably the the most misunderstood because I think this the construction change directive, which is the G714, and again, the, the, the numbering, you know, doesn't matter, and you're probably not going to see uh, an AIA number on the exam, um, but the construction change directive, I think that's the one that's most mysterious in the sense that if candidates don't think it fits into a change order, they just assume, oh, it's a construction change directive. Like it's a bigger umbrella, I think, than what Eric was saying earlier about all changes are, are a, a change order. If we understand change order, anything else we don't understand, oh, that's a construction change directive. So Eric, what, what is the construction change directive? And again, well, actually, uh, I'll let you explain it first and then we'll, we'll talk about the signatures on it. So the construction change directive or the CCD for short is essentially when the owner and the contractor are not in agreement on what the change to the contract sum or the contract time should be, but for the sake of the project and hoping to just keep the project moving forward, the architect is stepping up in their role as the initial decision maker right, which is, is spelled out in the owner-architect agreement. It's spelled out in the A201. Um, and so as initial decision maker, the architect is stepping forward saying, essentially, look, you're, you, you guys aren't agreeing. We need to keep this project moving forward. I'm going to issue a construction change directive, a CCD, with a proposed basis for change. It's going to add, you know, blank amount of dollars to the contract or blank number of days to the contract and we'll settle up later. That's essentially what the CCD is saying. I know you don't agree. I'm acknowledging you don't agree, but the second project, we're going to move forward and we'll settle up later because presumably this project is going to go on for a while. And this is probably not going to be the only disagreement we have. So let's just keep things moving forward in an amicable manner. And as initial decision maker, that's what I'm doing. That's the beauty of the CCD. So it serves a very clear mechanism, I think, in terms of keeping the project going. And it also is confronting the reality of, look, uh, we don't expect you guys to just agree. Owner and contractor often don't agree. That's fine. Um, but let's keep things friendly and moving forward and we'll settle up later. And that, if you think about it, that seems to be a very common thing that would happen. Right. And, and it's a good, it's a kind of a good faith document, right. In a sense, yeah. it's like, okay, here's the issue. We don't agree, but let's work it out later. This is the tool that the architect can use to force the contractor's hand to do the work. And, you know, I, you know, I don't like using the word force. I mean, that is what it's happening here, but we don't, we don't, in the real world, we don't use it like that. We don't come in with an iron fist and say, hey, contractor, you have to do this. It's more like, okay, this is, we don't agree. As Eric explained, let's just keep moving forward. 
here's the official document that again changes the the contract that you originally had with the owner general contractor and this is the legal document that allows you to move forward and we we all agree we will figure this out later now one interesting very interesting point about the construction change directive is if you look at the form again this is one page two so we're talking about three pages of documents right that all of you guys should by the by you know the end of this have looked at um because they really aren't confusing they're pretty self-explanatory but at the bottom there's three signatures just like the change order form right now we know remember the asi is just the architect signature but the change order and the construction change directive has the spot for the three signatures the three parties the difference here with the construction change directive, it only requires the architect and the owner's signature to become effective. It has a spot for the contractor's signature, but it's it's basically an acknowledgement. So to be in effect, it's just the architect and the owner's signature. Now, you might be asking, well, why would the contractor ever agree to this? Why would they put themselves in this position? Well, because they're using the AA contracts and part of that is the A201. These are the rules that the three parties have agreed to before beginning the project. So that's that's really um, the gist of it. So anything that just requires the architect or owner's signature, that's a construction change directive. A change order absolutely requires all three signatures. And the the language on the on the CCD I love because it's it says the owner, architect, and contractor should execute a change order to supersede this construction change directive to the extent that they agree. In other words, hey, later on, once you once you all agree on something, this CCD will be replaced by a proper change order where all three of you agree to a to a change in sum or a change in time. And it's a very reasonable way to to, to keep things moving and. Um, you, you said it perfectly. It's a good faith document because we're already operating under the construction contract. We don't want to build animosity. We're still operating in good faith. The owner's still making their payments. The contractor's still doing their work. The CCD is saying, okay, look, uh, we'll settle up later. I mean, it's just this, it's just this wonderful mechanism to move things forward. Um, and reasonable is the word that I keep coming back to in terms of talking about this, uh, as opposed to, no, I think it should be X and no, I think it should be Y. And then them arguing and yelling at each other's throats and then everything grinds to a halt. That would be terrible. And I think sometimes that's what we think because we, we hear of so many horror stories, right? There, there's already this animosity between the owner and the general contractor. Now add the architect in, you know, this is what we're talking about is, a project where things kind of, you know, everybody gets along to build this project. The ultimate goal, we all want to build it, right? And that's kind of what this is. This is not the weird scenario of, you know, both sides fighting and the contractor refusing to work and not show up and all that stuff. That's not what we're talking about. That's not really what the exam is testing us on. I mean, I suppose they could have some, you know, scenario type questions about that. But generally... This is how a project runs in a professional environment. All three parties have the same goal to have this project built. And it's not this adversarial relationship that we hear so much about. Exactly. Um, I did have one more thing I want to say about this. Uh, I can't uh, remember. Um, I think that. <laughs> I have some. I have some. I have something oh, yeah, to add ahead. to this last note. For a lot of candidates taking the ARE, the whole mystery of the construction price seems like this vague, veiled, mysterious thing. I think they have it in their mind that we have to rely on the contractor to tell us how much things cost. Um, and in a certain sense, it's they're building the work, they have to establish the price. But on the other hand, we also need to understand that we have the itemized bid, we have their schedule of values, we have their past applications for payment. We should have a good sense of what things cost. So if on your previous itemized bid, you saw that the carpeting was $20 a square foot installed, and that's what you've been billed at for this project all along, now a change order comes along and the contractor's saying, oh, it's $40 a square foot. Well, you as initial decision maker can say, no, it isn't. You've always been billing us at $20 a square foot. It can't possibly be $40 a square foot. 
And that could lead to the disagreement that moves it to a CCD, which is fine. But knowing that later you'll settle up and you're just keeping things moving forward. So we're agreeing to make this change that we're going to change this out for carpeting. We don't agree on the price yet or the time yet, but the CCD is the mechanism to move that forward. But you're relying on the past documents that are part of the construction contract to help you figure that out. The schedule of values, any itemized estimates or bids that you've had. You know, it's all of this is painting a picture of what things cost. And so we're not making these decisions in a in just a bare vacuum. We're we're building on our knowledge as we go, which is really such a great definition of, of a professional. That actually reminded me of what I wanted to say is a, a couple of things with that point, because I think, again, if we pay attention to sort of, or we hear the noise in the real world, that very adversarial contractor owner relationship, contractors trying to screw the owner and we're there to protect the, the owner interest, which is not really true. Um, we are there as a licensed professional to be fair to both parties. So I think in your example, Eric, um, maybe there is a legitimate reason that the contractor has to charge 40 now, right? But for whatever reason, time critical stuff, we don't have time to get into it right now. We'll figure it out later. And maybe the contractor states his case and maybe, okay, it's not 40, maybe it's 30, right? So it's not always this idea of the contractors out to screw the owner. You know, again, what I was saying earlier, everybody wants to get this project built and and things do change during construction. Maybe the carpet was $20, uh, you know, six months ago and it's some special thing. And now all of a sudden it doubled in price, right? That's the kind of stuff we as the licensed professional have to be fair to both parties. That's part of the initial decision maker. Just because our contract is with the owner doesn't mean we favor the owner. Uh, the same thing is when we're determining the work that the contractor is doing, matching the contract documents. We have to be fair to both parties as a licensed professional. So the other thing I want to mention is I think just, again, in this sort of the horror stories that we hear, it's always the contractor initiating change orders. You know, they're trying to take advantage of, of the owner. They're bidding low and then they're going to come in and they're going to do a bunch of change orders. Um, oftentimes change orders actually come from the owner. They can come from anybody. Like we could, we could initiate a change order, but oftentimes they actually come from the owner because they're visiting the job site and they want to add stuff. Right. If I, if I had a nickel for every time I heard an owner say, can we move that wall? <laughs> right. And I, and I'm like, well, technically we don't move the wall. We demolish the wall and build a new one that looks just like it six inches over. So are you sure you want to do, <laughs> you know, uh, but boom, that's a change order. But to your point, let's say, let's say the schedule of values or the or the the bid has shown carpeting at twenty dollars a square foot, and now the owner's like, well, I now that I see the carpeting, I love it, and I want it in the basement. And the owner's like, okay, that'll be forty dollars a square foot. Or you mean the, the contractor? Owner, yeah, the contractor. The contractor says forty a square foot. Yeah, the contractor says right, and the and the owner is saying, but wait a minute, I. For a fact, it was twenty dollars a square foot because when I went to pick it out, you told me to keep it within this range, and and the the contractor could come back with a very legitimate reason of, well, yes, but that was in the upstairs. This is in the basement, and in the basement we need a different pad and different, and I need to do a, a, a concrete leveling treatment, and so it's going to trigger all this other stuff. Again, by the contractor talking this out and communicating, and then you communicating this to the owner, saying, look. Here's what you don't realize. That was on a wood floor. This is on a basement floor and it needs all this other stuff. So it is really going to be $40 a square foot. I think that's a legitimate, uh, you know, price and we should agree to it. Then that could become a change order because we'll get everybody to agree. Right. So there are circumstances where, um, the real picture is a little, is of course always more complicated than, than we'd like it to be. But as part of our job, we are, you know, we are explaining to the owner how construction works. Exactly. And I, I think these, these three documents are actually good for understanding the responsibilities and the roles of the three parties during construction. And in the ideal world, which is kind of what this exam is based on, you know, everybody's on the same team and, um, and, and trust the process. And that's for you guys. Don't, don't just assume the contractor is trying to screw the owner, especially for the exam. That's, that's not NCARB's intent, right? Their intent is kind of what we've just been talking about 
during the construction process, do you as the architect, do you know what you're supposed to be doing? Do you know your role in this? And do you know your role if disagreements become, you know, come up between the architect, I mean, between the owner and the contractor? So yeah, this, this was great. Um, I think that'll wrap it up on behalf of uh, Eric Corey Freed. My name is David Doucette and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the ARE Podcast. Be sure to visit architectexamprep.com and check out our other podcast episodes, video tips, and the ARE blog. Remember to plan, practice, and pass.